Don't believe the newspaper headlines that are saying, oh, the rich are going to you know, make out like bandits with this tax legislation. Not true at all. This is going to make the tax code more progressive, which is not a good thing from my point of view. Hi, this is Nick Gillespie for Reason. Today we're talking with Chris Edwards. He's the director of tax policy at the Cato Institute. And we're talking about Republican tax reform and the implications for the economy and uh, what it means for libertarians. Chris, thanks for talking to hey, us. Hey, thanks a lot for having me, Nick. So uh, give us your general scorecard. Is this good? Is it bad? Is it somewhere in between? Well, the main driver here is the corporate tax reforms. Uh, United States has the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Uh, the Republicans would slash the corporate tax rate down pretty dramatically, down to 20 percent. And that's the, from 35 percent. From 35 down to 20 percent. Uh, that sounds pretty low, but actually the global average uh, rate is only 24 percent today. And if you think about the United States, we've got our federal rate, but we've got state uh, corporate taxes on top up to about uh, 10 percent or more. So even with the Republican cuts, we, we'd only just barely sort of start getting competitive globally. So that's the corporate stuff. Well, yeah. well before we get to the individual yeah. side with the corporate stuff, you know, one of the things that people, uh, uh, opponents of tax reform say, OK, so corporations make a huge amount of money. They're soulless, literally and figuratively. Why are we cutting taxes on corporations? And what what is what is the thinking behind that? Uh, you know that. Right. Why is that a good thing? So you, you'll hear critics say, "Well, corporate American corporations are usually profitable today. A lot of them are sitting on a big pile of cash. Why do they need tax cuts?" Uh, the reason is because corporations are forward-looking. They they think about building a new factory here versus in Mexico or China, and they look at that stream of future profits, and they look at the after, you know, how much uh, the the government tax grab on that will be. If you, uh, they might be sitting on cash now, but the reason they're not investing it is because the U.S. corporate tax rate is so high. So you cut the corporate tax rate. Corporations, uh, you know, at the margin, there will be more factories, more hiring will we'll make more sense in the United States versus our competitors. Uh, they will invest more. Uh, in the long run, then they will uh, they'll build more factories. You build more factories, you got to hire more workers. The demand for U.S. workers will this go up, but then like wages Trump's, will rise. But this is Trump's nightmare because then suddenly people from Mexico are going to start coming back to the United States <laughs> instead of leaving, right? Which is what uh, you know the demand for labor will yeah. go up a lot. So, oh, no. but you know the, the reality is, Nick, as you know, that even yeah. though the U.S. unemployment rate is pretty low now, our participation rate right. in the labor force has been falling, uh, especially for you know middle-aged uh, men for for a number of decades now. We want to get a lot of those folks off the sidelines back in the workforce. And I think the corporate tax cut will really goes to that issue. Um, there's also a shift, uh, and I guess this affects both the corporate as well as the uh, individual rates, but uh, the U.S. Uh, currently taxes on a global basis both plans would shift it to a territorial basis. That's What's right. the difference and why is that important? So, so right now, U.S. corporations, you think about a, a big corporation like General Motors or DuPont or Intel, they have subsidiaries in dozens and dozens of countries around the world. The United States today says, we're going to tax you on your, your global operations. So I'll give you, think about this. So DuPont, let's say they have a subsidiary in Brazil making some chemical product to supply the Brazilian market, okay? The U.S. government taxes that, uh, you know, those profits right now. But let's say you think about a German chemical company with a subsidiary in Brazil serving the Brazilian market. The German government at home doesn't really care what the subsidiary does. And so it's more competitive than the U.S. subsidiary. So how does that affect us? Uh, we want our foreign subsidiaries to be competitive because they expand their sales in global markets. The profits pour back into the United States. And that tends to suck exports out of the United States. When our corporations do well abroad, they take a lot of uh, imported intermediate goods from you know, the US, their U.S. production. So uh, we want um, our multinationals to do well. It means they'll invest more here. Uh, more global headquarters of companies will locate here. And their foreign subsidiaries will do well, which is good for our uh, workers and our economy. As you know, there's been this uh, uh, drain over the last few decades on multinationals moving their headquarters out of the United States because it's a, a punishing place to locate the headquarters of multinational. Republicans move to what's called a territorial system, so that'll draw multinational uh, headquarters back to the United States and, and, and yeah. So if the, uh, you know, the corporate side or the business side of this seems pr uh, pretty good, and, and from a libertarian, from a free market angle, there's not that much to complain about other than that, you know, rates could always be lower. Um, the individual side is more of a shit show, right? 
Absolutely. It's basically, re, uh, you know, re reassembling deck chairs uh, on a, a really messy and, and horribly complex uh, system. There is a little bit of simplification. Republicans double the standard deduction. So that means more people will be taking the standard deduction, less people taking itemized deductions like the mortgage interest right. deduction. So that's good. It's a bit of a simplification. There's a little bit of rate cutting. Mm -hmm. I think that the Joint Committee on Taxation, the official scoring body, uh, found that there'd be about an average of about a 2% marginal rate cut on the individual side, sort of on average. So that's that's good, uh, but there's you know there's a lot of uh, there'll be a lot of new complexity. Republicans will cut uh, the tax rate on so-called pass-through or small businesses a little bit, but the rules will be very complicated. So you know if you're a law firm, you don't get the rate cut, but if you're a small manufacturing firm, you do get the rate mm -hmm. cut. There'll be a lot of lobbying and fighting over over those sorts of breaks. Why is it good to get people out of itemizing deductions? You know, you said like, you know, by increasing a standard right. deduction, you know, why is why why is itemization bad? Uh, be, because it, I think it treats people unfairly. I mean, right now, the more, you know, renters don't get this special break from the government, but homeowners do get this special break from the government. Uh, it's the same as other itemized uh, deductions. Why should the government be playing favorites? giving special breaks for some Americans, not others. I think we ought to have low rates and equal treatment across the board. You pay a certain flat percentage on what you earn, although I would have a, you know, a large deduction at the bottom because you don't, there's no point taxing people who are, say, below the poverty level because they just get the government benefits anyway. So have a big, giant uh, exemption and then tax everyone a flat rate across what, the board equally. We're in a situation where it might even be a majority of Americans live in households that pay no federal income tax. Right. That, you know, on a certain level, that seems great. It's, you know, you're poor, you shouldn't be paying it. But when you're talking about half of the population, why does it present a problem to take everybody off the tax rolls? Well, of course, I mean, I, I think people, one of the reasons why you want to go to a flat tax where everyone pays a, an equal sort of amount is that everyone feels the pain of big government. Mm -hmm. Taxes are the price of government. You want people to, to feel the price. And so that, you know, if, if they feel the full price of government, it limits the demand for big government. So that's a good thing. You're right, about 45% of uh, U.S. households now pay absolutely no federal income tax, uh, unfortunately. And so the tax code is extremely progressive, to use the liberal word for that. I use the word graduated, meaning you know people at the top pay this huge uh, bulk of taxes. So to, as you know, some of these numbers, you know, the top one percent of highest earners pay forty percent of all federal income taxes. It's really incredible, and that the share, the burden paid by the top group, has gone up and up and up, which means that the share paid by everyone else, by most voters, has gone down. So they're demanding more uh, government. So that's not a good thing. Here's, a, here's sort of a startling statistic. The United States has the most progressive or graduated income tax code of all the OECD industrial countries. The most progressive of all. It's and remarkable. That means and this that, is America. That means you know? that it goes from, you know, poor people, relatively poor people pay little or no taxes. That's right. Them. The wealthier you are, the more right. you're more highly taxed you are. Don't believe the newspaper headlines that are saying, oh, the rich are going to, you know, make out like bandits with this tax legislation. Not true at all. This is going to make the tax code more progressive, which is not a good thing from my point of view. You know, the other thing is that the overall, you know, uh, level of revenue that's generated. I mean, for most of the 21st century, we've been pulling in about uh, tax or government revenue from all sources, about 17 percent of GDP. Uh, right around there, uh, there were some declines during the recession and whatnot. Will this tax reform increase that amount? And if it does, is that a good thing from a kind of libertarian market point of view? Do we want the government to be actually taking more income out of out of our pockets? So the Republicans have, have uh, set aside a trillion and a half dollars over 10 years for this tax cut. And that's sort of a scored in a static uh, basis. But some of the business reforms will increase uh, you know, GDP, will move, uh, move the economy upwards, so that'll cause a reflow of revenue to the government. <clears throat> However, it's still going to be a revenue loser for the government. This will be a net tax cut uh, <laughs> overall. And the reason is, as we were just discussing, a lot of the individual tax changes don't do anything for economic growth, so they're just a pure revenue loss to the government. So those sorts of tax cuts, I could take or leave it. Mm -hmm. um, it's If you believe in sort of starve the beast, then, you know, yeah, let people keep more of their money. But for me, I think that if we're going to cut taxes, we ought to cut taxes in a way that makes the overall economy grow more strongly. Well, let's talk a little bit about starve the beast, which is the idea that if you reduce the amount of money that government can raise, uh, right. it will spend less. And that right. pretty clearly is just a, a wrong theory, because 
uh, we've been, you know, just borrowing and borrowing more and more money, and nobody did that really more than George W. Bush. Uh, you know, and Barack Obama kind of followed in his footsteps right. of just, you know, putting more and more on a kind of national credit card. Is there any connection? Because this is what Republican proponents of tax reform say. Look, we're going to get the government, we're going to drop taxes and the drag on the economy, and then we're going to get to spending cuts. Is there any reason to believe that? Um, or what, is, what are the steps that lead from tax reform to spending cuts down the road? So let me start at the state government level. State governments are required to balance their budgets every year. So Starve of the Beast could, does probably work because a, you know, a governor cuts taxes, then it really forces the legislature down the road to cut the spending. U.S. federal government, of course, can, can, can deficit money, spend yeah. as much as it wants. Right. So Starve of the Beast doesn't seem to work anymore. I think a few decades back, Starve of the Beast did work because politicians were scared of big deficits. You saw during the 80s, Reagan cut taxes, and then there was a big movements uh, with various budget reform plans to try to restrain spending. That is no longer the case. And the reason is because we have global capital markets. The U.S. government can borrow as much as it wants. Uh, and it doesn't push up interest rates. It doesn't push up people's mortgage uh, rates. It doesn't cause any pain for so politicians. Then why so why should we worry about deficits? Because and this is something, right. you know, when, when Republicans are in power and they're running up deficits, Democrats are like, we need fiscal right. sanity. When Democrats are in power, the Republicans suddenly become deficit hawks, and then that disappears very quickly. But why is mounting national debt a problem if the U.S. can keep borrowing money essentially for free? Uh, a couple of reasons. One is most economists think that some big financial or economic crash will come down the road as our debt keeps piling up over the decades. The second reason is just the ethics of it. Borrowing now deficits debt uh, pushes costs to the future. And you can see that for, uh, as, from a libertarian perspective very simply. Right now, if the government has a big spending program, it goes out and borrows $10 billion for a spending program. No one is hurt in the short run. People who get the spending benefit, um, the creditors who lend more money to the government, they don't mind because they're doing it voluntarily. So no one seems to lose and no one does now. But in the future, we got to pay back the debt. Uh, the government's got to go out and use its coercion to raise the taxes. So from a libertarian perspective, you can see the pain is moved to the future mm. uh, when the government borrows more now. And that's just, you know, it's unethical, I think. So does the Republican tax reform plan actually get us to some, you know, is there some event horizon where we're actually going to cut year over year spending? Or is this just kind of smoke and mirrors of, uh, you know, back in the... Uh, I guess in, in the early 90s, George H.W. Bush pushed through a tax plan, which was wildly unpopular. He had made a no new taxes pledge. And all the Republicans, all conservatives, all libertarians said he was a sucker because what he, he made the rookie mistake of raising taxes now in the name of spending cuts down the road and the spending cuts never come. Now we're in a world where we're doing tax cuts now with spending cuts promised. Are we just as big suckers? <laughs> uh, well, so perhaps there's no relationship between taxes and spending at all. I mean, uh, you know, at the federal level, politicians like to cut taxes. They like to increase spending. Maybe there's no relationship. I'll give you one way that the Republican tax cuts, if they go through in the next couple of weeks, may be positive. And that is it does take the whole tax reform issue off the plate of the Republican politicians for a while. For many years, Republican politicians, they can, they can um, prove their, uh, their conservative bona fides by claiming they're there for big tax reform, and it's always a, sort of a crowd pleaser with Republican voters. But they don't actually have to do it. Because, but you're right, yeah, they yeah, keep yeah. saying, okay, we're gonna yeah. do tax reform down the road. But this sort of does take it off the, um, the agenda, I think, for a while. Uh, and then, um, and, and it often, you know, a lot of this is going to depend on what the Trump administration does. And Trump has a very good budget director, as you know, who is pushing spending cuts. I think Republicans put a tax cut, uh, you know, into law this, this uh, you know, before Christmas uh, this year. Uh, then the next year, it does open up the uh, spending cutters on Capitol Hill to really push more for spending cuts. And I'll give you an example of that. I mean, the House Freedom Caucus now, uh, the, the most conservative members in the House, they're kind of, uh, they're, they're holding their fire now on spending cuts because they want the tax cut to go through mm -hmm. first. The tax cut goes through, signed into law. I think it's going to really uh, open up uh, the, uh, you know, the, the scenarios so for spending cuts. The, uh, you know, the, uh, to make a meaningful spending cuts, you've got to go where the money is. And that really means old age entitlements, Medicare and Social Security and right. defense spending. Uh, none of those seem to be anything that Republicans are, you know, uh, known for even 
pretending that they want to cut. So, I mean, are those on the, would, will those be on the table assuming tax reform? So to, to Trump's credit, he actually does go after some of the entitlements. So uh, Social Security Disability Insurance is a $150 billion program. It is a giant spending program and it's hugely wasteful. What it does is it has encouraged millions of Americans uh, who only have marginal disabilities, who should be in the workforce. Uh, it's kept them out of the workforce, even though really, you know, they should be in the workforce. A lot of them want to work. But if you take any disability money, you essentially can't work. It's a crazy system. Trump has proposed reforms on that system uh, to his credit. So that is the type of, you know, reform that I think could move ahead next year. Okay. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Nick. We've been talking with Chris Edwards. He's the director of tax policy at the Cato Institute, and he's looking forward to tax reform and spending reform. Absolutely. For reason, I'm Nick Gillespie.